Hello, hello, hello. Welcome to the Emerging Civil War podcast. I'm not Chris Mikowski. I'm Darren Rawlings. But joining me today from his house on the Chancellorsville battlefield is Chris Mikowski. Welcome, Chris. Yes, thanks for having me. Excellent. Now <laughs> It's weird being on this side of the microphone. It, it is. And I'm just going to say, you know, because so for people that don't know, Chris has recently authored a new book. Uh, it's about the Battle of Spotsylvania Courthouse, and it's called A Tempest of Iron and Lead, Spotsylvania Courthouse, May 8th through to the 21st, which is published by Savage BT. Now, Chris can't interview himself. Now, I I, I, thought, to, I thought about this, Chris, and I thought, actually, you could probably do a Gollum sketch. Oh, yes. You know, or Smeagol, and you could sort of interview yourself. But again, I don't know whether that would work or not. <laughs> Tell me about Spotsylvania. Well, let me tell you about that. <laughs> yeah. I got to hunker down there. <laughs> I don't know why I just had visions of that, especially being a Lord of the Rings fan like yourself. No, but you you have authored this new book. But we're not going to talk about the book straight away because there's, you know, what I would like to do is take us back to when you first became interested in the Battle of Spotsylvania. Because a lot of people know your history with Fredericksburg and the Chancellorsville stuff when you used to volunteer there. But what is it and what was it about Spotsylvania that captivated your imagination? And it's funny because it was the battlefield around here that I knew the least about. Um, I came to Spotsy the first time on a vacation with my daughter, Stephanie, and we were tracking down Stonewall Jackson sites. And so we had actually come here to go to the Jackson Shrine for the first time. We arrived um, kind of late afternoon after the shrine had closed. And so I was like, well, you want to do something tonight before, you know, we um, turn in for the evening. And and she said, let's uh, let's try this place called the Bloody Angle because it had the name the Bloody Angle. So I was like, all right, fine. And so we, we came out to Spotsy and we walked around and had a wonderful time because it was just such a, a beautiful evening. It was peaceful. Uh, we basically had the battlefield to ourselves. And so really made a strong impression on me just as being kind of this. Uh, you know, beautiful place of solitude. And then we ended up going to the Jackson Shrine and kind of doing the Jackson stuff. So, you know, and that was well before uh, either of us were associated with this park, before we started volunteering, before I worked here, before I lived here, you know, that's, you know, almost 25 years ago, I guess. And uh, so then when I uh, started volunteering at the park, you know, Spotsy was still kind of the one I knew the least about and just over time have, have fallen in love with it. Um, because it's such a beautiful place because the story that it, that took place there was just so stunning in its awfulness and to juxtapose those two things against each other. It's just always kind of been a really um, captivating space for me to occupy. So that's kind of, you know, Spotsy has just drawn me further and further in. So I, I went from being kind of a Stonewall Jackson guy, which I still am, but uh, you know, that's kind of where I thought my civil war focus would always be. And I'm really kind of like a Spotsylvania guy instead. Mm -hmm. And of course, you spend a lot of time walking out there, don't you? Being so close and everything, uh, even to, to today, you know. So, yeah. Um, OK, let's talk about because you did write an emergency Civil war series book with, I think, your colleague, Chris White. Is that right? Back yep. in the early days. So this was this following on from the Fredericksburg um, book. Yeah. So when we had started the Emerging Civil War series, we had started with a book about Fredericksburg. Uh, and then we'd follow that up with a book about Jackson's wounding. And then um, Ted Savas, our publisher at Savas Beatty, he's like, oh, wait, well, you know, there's this Spotsylvania book you guys have been talking about. Let's do that, too. And we wanted them out in time for the Spotsy or, or for the Chancellorsville 150th because there would be a lot of foot traffic. And um, so the Spotsy book, even though Spotsylvania took place a year after Chancellorsville, would benefit from just all that foot traffic of people being in the park for the 150th. So Chris and I actually wrote a season of slaughter in less than a month and got it written, proofread, designed, and off to the publisher. Those were um, back in the days when when Ted was uh, very nimble as a printer. He can't do that anymore because of uh, COVID-related uh, shortages. Um, but we got that book out in, you know, basically two months from starting from scratch. Um, and ever since then, we've we've written about Spotsy in other ways uh, for Blue and Gray Magazine, for Hallowed Ground, for Civil War Times. And uh, just eventually over time, this sort of accumulated body of Spotsy stuff that we've written. It was something I kind of wanted to pull together into, into a larger study. So that was the genesis of A Tempest of Iron and Lead. Mm -hmm. And again, you sort of answered my next question because I was going to get onto the new book. So 
that is basically everything pulled together and put in. And again, the inspiration behind you wanting to tell that story in more detail, where is the inspiration for that? Yeah, well, and it, it's funny because I thought like, we'll just take these magazine articles we've written and we'll collect them together. Um, a, a lot of people do that. They take their essays from different places and put them together. And uh, we knew there were parts of the battle we hadn't written about. So we thought, you know, well, well, let's just kind of write some stuff to fill in the gaps and, you know, we'll have a book. And uh, unfortunately, Chris wasn't able to then um, continue on with the project because of some work obligations he had with the American Battlefield Trust. So I'm sort of was sort of left with this collection of magazine articles and I had to start filling in the blanks. And the more I wrote, the more I realized I needed to write. And so um, the magazine articles all sort of fell by the wayside. They're kind of in there a little bit in very skeletal form. <laughs> um, but I had to just rewrite everything just to kind of go with the flow and the, keep the style consistent and everything. So um uh they're they're in there in spirit <laughs> this is probably the best way to put it but if you were to look at one of my blue and gray uh issues that chris and i did together and then go look at the new book you're not going to find a whole lot of you know pages of verbatim stuff at all it's all been rewritten and added to um you know uh, that's another one of the fun things about the book was that you know, I, I've found so many more sources. I know the sources that I did have better. Um, you know, I've just had more insight walking around the battlefields and talking to people and stuff. So, uh, you know, some of the stuff that we wrote in, early in our career versus what I have in this new book uh, is definitely matured over time. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay. So I know you mentioned the battlefield there, and that is sort of like one of my next questions as well, because obviously we always tell people that if you don't go out and walk these battlefields, you're never really going to understand a battle. So how much did you rely on actually? And again, you've been there quite some time now, so you have time to go out there. Did you go out there again and study that battlefield? And what sort of resources are you using when you go out to study this battlefield? That's a great question because, you know, we, we talk about the battlefields as being primary source documents, you know, in the way that a diary or a letter might be like, it's something that was there at the time that sheds light on, uh, on these stories. Uh, but, you know, and you've seen it, you know, people show up at these battlefields and they're like, Oh, that's a field. Okay. So, you know, in, on one hand, they're irreplaceable primary sources, but if you don't have other context for them, those sources are, are fairly meaningless. So going out with um, some of those other sorts of documents, like taking taking somebody's letters or diary and kind of reading their experience and then going onto the field to see what they were seeing and what they're writing and see if you can get it matched up. Um, understanding how people's memories changed over time and so like oh well this guy was writing this you know 30 years later and he misremembered it because you know the little creek he's talking about it's over here not over there you know and that you know and so you're able to kind of understand those those written documents better by being on the ground and trying to match them up but then you can also um you know, be on the ground and then be like ah this is what this guy was talking about here's what's you know here's why he did this or here's why they did that you know and so it's a really good way to kind of match the written record with uh what we think we know about the events and, and get into those whys why did they do this why did they go here why did they do that you know why was this a, a particular important spot mm -hmm. and obviously you mentioned taking out letters there so did you have any moments of like you know where you're standing there and wow you know this is really pulled at your emotions that you're reading someone's account and you're actually standing where they would have been standing. One of the cool things I get to do when I do tours for guests who stay at Stevenson Ridge, uh, which is a historic property that my wife's family owns on part of the battlefield. Um, you know, I'll take guests out on tours and, and, you know, occasionally someone will be like, Oh, I had an ancestor who was in this regiment. And, you know, can we go see where they were? And they like to walk in the footsteps of their ancestors. And so for me, it's always a treat to be able to help someone today connect with the story of their own family in a, in a way that is meaningful to them. Um, I had a student once that uh, I did a field trip from St. Bonaventure down to the battles, uh, battlefields down here. And uh, a student had a great, great, great uncle that was killed at Spotsy. And I took him to the spot where the regiment fought. I can't remember the unit. He, they were from um, um, from Western New York, though. Um, so, uh, actually, they were was, was with the 49th New York. Now that I'm thinking about it. Um, and uh, 
it took him to that spot and like, you know, here's where your ancestor fought. And he stood next to the earthworks and he cried, you know, and he's, you know, here's this you know 21 year old kid who's crying on a battlefield that he'd never visited before because he had that visceral connection. And uh, so I always remember, you know, those sorts of experiences where people get to, to connect with their own history by walking in those footsteps. Mm -hmm. And I noticed behind you, you got a great picture of uh, John Sedgwick's um, monument there. Yeah. And, uh, you know, um, one of the highest ranking officers to be killed at the battle. Is that correct? So is he, he factored into your new book? He is. Um, so Sedgwick was killed on May 9th, 1864. He's the highest ranking Union officer killed during the entire war um, in any theater. Uh, and some people will say, look, what about James McPherson? He was commanding an army in Atlanta, which is true. Uh, so he's higher up in the food chain. But Sedgwick's uh, commission as major general actually predated McPherson. So he was more senior in that regard. Um, and Sedgwick was trying to reposition some of his men who were under sniper fire from members of Kershaw's brigade. And, uh, you know, he famously said, ah, they can't hit an elephant at this distance. And they hit him. And he dies instantly on the battlefield. And uh, every May 9th, I go out to Spotsylvania. I pay my respects to Uncle John, uh, you know, visit his, his memorial. I usually write about it for the blog. People are sort of wondering after all these years, what more do I have to say about John Sedgwick? Um, but it's just one of those stories that, um, you know, because his marker is in such a prominent spot, it's right near the entrance of the battlefield. And so you can't miss it as you're driving on there. Um, you know, it's it's one of those spots that, really sort of demands people look at it. Uh, and I like to kind of go there on my own terms, not on the terms of the monument and really kind of think about, um, you know, here's this, this, you know, high ranking guy who's uh, a bachelor married to the army his whole life. His men call him uncle John and he gets gunned down and uh, it's a personal tragedy, you know, and to think about, um, you know, being able to put a personal face on, on the scope of the tragedy at Spotsylvania is, is, um, important to me because it can be a faceless thing because of all the, the carnage and destruction. And so John Sedgwick sort of personifies the, a face of some of that for me. And I can be testament to the the fact that, like you just said, where it's at the entrance, because I think I drove past it twice or maybe even three times in my last stay. And uh, I'm still frustrated because I still didn't get to stop there properly because um, just didn't have time. But again, it's an important place for me as well. I, you know, I really really respect the story and and the guy but there's not really much resources out there written about him is there really um there's not uh he, he um because he didn't have a wife that he's sending letters to he does have a, a collection of letters that he wrote to his sister and so um you can kind of read that um his men you know really admired him for being personally brave yeah, he gets grievously wounded at, at antietam he misses the battle of fredericksburg comes back in time to get promoted and put in charge of the sixth corps um misses a fair amount of the battle of gettysburg just because he's kind of bringing up the rear um but uh and of course at chancellorsville i skipped over chancellorsville he's the only guy that has any success by winning the second battle of fredericksburg uh at uh during the chancellorsville campaign and then gets stymied hours later at salem church so he's one of those fascinating guys to me in that you know he has no razzle dazzle he's not fancy and you know one of those civil war names a lot of people know and they think of like oh john sedgwick he's the great martyr and blah 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 you know um but he was steady. He was solid. He was dependable. He wanted something done. You know, it might take him a while to get it done, but he'll make sure it gets done. You know, it's that kind of dependability. Yeah. Okay. Let's let's go back into the actual battle itself, because like I said, it's one of the most hellish battles you you're ever going to read about, and so you must have a strong stomach when you're delving into those, you know, those source material um, letters and things like that. Is it is it really sort of gory stuff to read? Is it quite chilling? Some of it is, yeah. Um, it's funny you should mention that because I actually struggled with it uh, with this book because uh, some of the violence is so graphic, and uh, it's easy to be, you know, working at it, working at it, working at it, and then suddenly you've written something that that some people might think is sensationalistic. You know, like you're just, you know, basically like being pornographic in the way that you can treat some of this violence because it's just so explicit and so horrifying and, and, you know, like a car wreck, you can't not look, even though this is terrible. I gotta keep, you know, um, and I really struggled with that because uh, to me, this is not sensationalistic at all. It's not um, titillating. Um, 
and and it's easy to to kind of play up how dramatic that is um, because of that stuff. So, you know, finding that balance between uh, portraying what actually happened and, and making sure that people understand how grisly and how violent and how awful it was um, balance that against just sort of like, what am I comfortable about? And I'm not, a, you know, I'm not a prude and I'm, you know, uh, you know, but I just like, I don't want to be indecent about it. And so just finding that balance is, was really challenging for me because um, as you suggest, a lot of those accounts and there are many of them are just uh, um, just punch in the gut. Awful. Mm -hmm. and do you have trouble so when you're writing stuff like that and do, do you have trouble switching off from that you know what you're doing to going back to you know normal life and just being a family guy you know is it is that does that is that difficult um you know that's a great question um i don't think so only because i tend to do my writing at night like after everybody else has gone to bed and then i will write till i'm literally too exhausted to keep writing um, so it's easy to shut off because my brain is basically uh, shutting itself off uh, and I don't go to bed, you know, dreaming about it or anything like that. And so, you know, it's easy to kind of wake up the next day and attack the day fresh and, and off you go. Um, the other thing that I do sometimes, too, is I'll go out to the battlefield and just sort of walk around and, and you know, look to have a moment, you know, and uh, what's going to speak to me out there? How can the landscape? Because it's so beautiful, you know, how can the landscape recharge me and reset? Um, uh, you know, as I mentioned earlier, that that juxtaposition between how beautiful it is and how awful the story is um, and that space, um, you know, I just find a lot of energy in the tension there. And uh, mm -hmm. so that's a good way for me to kind of reset myself. Yeah, there's definitely an energy there. When I went on the last tour, I felt that energy when I first got there, I must admit. And I had to take a couple of moments for myself to sort of get myself set. Um, but again, you know, did that fantastic tour. Um, but well, yeah, and, so, and I always, I always remind people too, like, you yeah. know, yeah, it was horrible, but like the veterans would be glad you were out there walking around and enjoying mm -hmm. yourself and enjoying the beautiful day and, and appreciating how beautiful it was. Because like, you know, that's the kind of stuff they were trying to preserve. <laughs> You know, that's the sort of thing that they were fighting for. And so to be out there and remember them, I think, is the highest compliment we can pay. Mm -hmm. And what I really love about the American Civil War, and I'll keep saying this over and over again, obviously, you've got the characters. But when you when you're looking at some of these events and battles that take place, there's things that you that you come across. And, and I'll get on to the, the point of it in a moment is where you're like, wow, did that actually really happen? It's like something wrote a script for a Hollywood movie. So we've got the 22 inch oak tree, which is fouled by the mini ball. And again, you just can't write this stuff, you know, I mean, so for a writer, it must be great to have that, you know, already there for you. You know, you haven't got to, if you know what I mean. Yeah, I mean, like, it's already so dramatic, you don't need to make things up, right? Um, and they're the kind of things that if a fiction writer made them up, you wouldn't believe them, you know? And uh, that's what I love about history. Probably the greatest example, you know, I want to jump wars here for a second, is when Thomas Jefferson and John Adams die on the same day, and it's the 50th anniversary of the signing of the Declaration of Independence, which they both, like, you couldn't make that up and get away with it, and yet it really happened, right? And so, like, history is just full of those sorts of things. And, you know, so Spotsylvania just, you know, serves those kind of things up on a platter as far as, as just great compelling details yeah and going back to i mean if you want to see an example people of of, of bullets uh so at fredericksburg they have a canister full of uh mini balls and i believe it's what's fired in a minute at fredericksburg and so when i saw that in my last visit i was like that really put it into context for me i did take a photograph of it and gina was just like whoa that's uh my uh, friend from the uh, monuments team um wow and it's like that was just at fredericksburg so i can't even imagine what and and you even hear of ones like uh, say the hornet's nest at uh, shiloh you know um just can't imagine what these places must have been like the you know horrendous places my um, my friend uh, my friend don bonds who used to be a historian at uh, fredericksburg and spotsylvania national military park uh, he said early in his career, and he'd be stationed out at Spotsy, one of their assignments, after it rained, there were a, a pair of uh, five-gallon plastic buckets that were in the maintenance closet. And after it rained, they were supposed to take those buckets out to the battlefield and pick up as many bullets as they could. And when the bullets were full, or when the buckets were full, they were done. You know, and it's like... Well, like that was a job, <laughs> you know, like <laughs> picking literally picking a bucket full of, of bullets. Um, so yeah, I mean, when you talk about how much lead is is thrown through the air around here, it's incredible. 
Yeah. And, uh, and you know, we'll get onto the title in a minute and I can understand why they've sort of gone for that title. But um, what I would like to talk about, obviously, a lot of people will know the main story and the main battle of um, the Battle of Spotsylvania, but some people are not so familiar with the second. It's sort of a second battle. And so I'm talking about later on, after the main assault, there is another assault, which is not often talked about. So is that included in the book? Yeah, so, uh, you know, Spotsylvania is, you know, basically 13 days of fighting, uh, a lot of maneuvering, there's a lot of rain, and, you know, Grant's shifting his army, Lee's shifting his army to counter, and so we tend to think about a couple of the assaults um, as the main parts of the battle, but there's a lot of stuff that either gets forgotten about or overlooked, or um, the Park Service didn't own the property and so it never interpreted that part of the battle so people forgot about it um uh and so yeah i mean uh so you're you're alluding to an assault that happened on may 18th over the same ground that the federals attacked on may 12th and the park for a long time didn't interpret that assault at all it's like battle of bloody angle on the 12th fight's over you know there's a whole nother week of Spotsylvania that happens after the fight at the mule shoe and the bloody angle and uh, so, yeah, the one on the 18th was every bit as big as the one on the 12th, but because Confederate artillery was so well entrenched, it really pinned down the federal assault columns and they couldn't even get within rifle range as a result. And so uh, that only lasts for three hours rather than 22 hours. Uh, and Grant's like, eh, this isn't working. Let's just call this thing off. Uh, and that's really when he makes the decision to pull out of, of Spotsylvania. Uh, but then Lee hits him the next day at Harris Farm uh, in Grant's rear. So, like, you know, there's always just this other, there's always just one more thing, always one more thing, you know. Uh, even after the army start pulling out uh, on the night of the 20th and into the 21st, and, you know, sort of people are thinking about that march down toward North Anna. Uh, and A.P. Hill is is just, you know, his corps is trying to poke at the 6th Corps and the ninth Corps in the rear. You know, there's they're still stuff going on at Spotsy, even after the armies are on their way out. So, uh uh, lots, lots of ground to cover. Okay, and I'm in, uh, at the beginning of the podcast. You mentioned obviously you pulling all those resources together, but did you learn anything new when you started delving back into a lot of this stuff? That's a great question too, and I think that you know as 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 much as I've known about Spotsy, as much as I've talked about Spotsy, as much as I've written about Spotsy. Um, I always hope that I don't think I know everything there is to know about Spotsy. You know, I want there to always be something. The big thing for me working on this book is it forced me to reconsider my attitudes about Governor K. Warren, the fifth corps commander. And Warren's one of those guys he's easy to make fun of because he's kind of a dandy and he's got a goofy mustache. And, um, you know, people know him as the savior of Little Round Top. Uh, and then he just performs so officiously throughout the campaign that he's just like you kind of scratch your head because it's like he always he's he thinks he's the smartest guy in the room and he knows it and wants everybody else to know it too and indeed he's he's a brilliant engineer um but he doesn't have that bigger picture that like mead or grant has and so he's always second guessing all these different orders that it gets and so he does not perform particularly well in the wilderness for instance uh, and then he gets to spotsy and he doesn't perform well at Spotsy either. And so it's just like, oh, yeah, well, you know, Warren's screwing up again. He's messing up. And because eventually he does get sacked at Five Forks in the closing days of, of the war in Virginia, um, you know, people just sort of assume like, well, yeah, finally he gets sacked. You know, this is a long time coming. Um, and that's kind of the, the lens people look at Warren through. And I've tried to be fair about him. But really, you know, as I worked at this book, I, I became a bit more sympathetic toward him because he got criticized by Meade and Grant for the way he attacked in the wilderness. So he tried to attack the way Meade and Grant told him to at Spotsy, and it didn't work out. And so, you know, he he was trying to do what they told him to do, and it wasn't working out. So it was like a damned if you do, damned if you don't sort of thing. And he ends up having to assault against Confederate positions that are essentially impregnable. And the longer the Confederates are there on that part of the battlefield, the more they're digging in, they're more improving their work. So the works only get stronger. And Grant keeps saying, order Warren to attack. And like Warren finds out pretty early 
how hard those positions are to take. And, uh, and it only gets worse. And, and it's, you know, by the 12th, Warren's like, I don't want to send my guys against that position again and have them get slaughtered again. Uh, and Grant really criticizes him for like, ah, oh, you're not being robust enough. But like Warren's learning some hard lessons. And uh, so kind of getting into that, which I do in the book a bit more, um, you know, that, that really was the big, the biggest thing I took away from this book. It was a long answer. I apologize. That's all right. You're fine. It's your podcast. Um, yeah. <laughs> no, but um, no, it's not. It's your podcast today. Yeah, of course it is. Yeah, great. He's he's working on that accent. It's getting better. Um, anyway, I must I must ask. Um, so out of all of the, you know, the main guys involved in this battle, as in far as officers, who wrote the most on Spotsy? Out mm. of maybe Confederate Union, you know, what you really yeah. sort of relied on for that source material. I need to think about that for a second. Let me back into that answer, though, and say that Grant did not write about it, and I wish he had written more about it. Um, by the time he gets to Spotsy and North End in his memoirs, he's dying of throat cancer, um, you know, suffering the throes of cocaine addiction to numb the pain. And he actually leaves a note to one of his sons that says, like, I wish I had more time to write about Spotsy and North End that could be improved upon. Um and some of the facts that he has in there are wrong. You know, like, for instance, he has Thomas Greeley Stevenson dying at the wrong place and stuff like that. Um, and again, he's he's dying of cancer. <laughs> he's breezing through that. Um, so his perspective would have been good. I really like, um, and now that I've had the chance to, to kind of think, I really like Theodore Lyman's stuff. Um, he's His journals are wonderful to read anyway. The guy has got an extraordinary talent for describing other people just in a sentence or two. He creates these really vivid sketches of folks. Mead sends him, he's, he's Mead's um, aide. And so Mead sends him all over the battlefield on all these different missions and his journals are written contemporaneously. And then he does go back and kind of revise them after the war and, and they're published in book form that way. But his journals, um, they're just a marvel to read and he's insightful. Um, uh, he's very protective of Mead. Um, and, uh, so, so really good stuff. Um, someone else who I wish had written more or better was, uh, Walter Taylor on the Confederate side. Taylor writes three books after the war and none of them are very interesting and none of them are detailed <laughs> enough. Um, everyone looked at him as kind of like the authority because he is Robert E. Lee's aide. And so they, you know, expected him to settle disputes and this, and that, and the other thing. And he's just not, uh, it was not. A, a talented writer in that regard. So stuff's not very clear and it's not very specific and it's not very fair. So I would have liked to have seen more from him. Mm -hmm. Okay. This is a big question before we get on to the uh, title itself. Um, what was your favorite part of writing this book? Oh, that's um, maybe in just that, that I, uh, I always found more to write about. Um, you know, and again, you know, geez, gosh, I know Spotsy so well. And yet I just get, oh, and I want to write about this and let me dive into this a little bit more and let me flesh this out a little bit more. And so there's always just something more to write and I never got tired of it. Um, you know, this probably it's 130,000 words. It could probably be longer, but at some point you have to say no and, and not use every single source you have. Um, so that was probably my favorite. It was just a, it was a living, breathing process of discovery as I went. Mm -hmm. um, and it was also like boot camp because originally, you know, I was trying to get this done in time to be out in time for the emerging Civil War Symposium at the beginning of August. Um, we got delayed by the Library of Congress with some stuff they were supposed to issue and they were slow about doing that. And then some um, delays with the at the printer just with paper supply um, set us back. So unfortunately, that didn't happen. But in the meantime, <laughs> through the spring, I was just chugging along on this just you know writing super intensively to try to get the manuscript done in time um and so and so that was um a really um i don't, I don't want to say it was a, a powerful experience but it was an intensive experience um a little stressful on my marriage at times <laughs> um god bless my wife jennifer and her patience um but it was super intense and i i as a writer i kind of got through a lot of that too mm -hmm. 
Okay, so again, the the idea behind the title, where did you come up with that? And it's, I mean, it's pretty obvious. Uh, all the lead flying around everywhere in Spotsy, but um, yeah. yeah, and it it actually describes action that takes place on Spindle Field, um, which uh, at Laurel Hill Spindle Field, uh, the names are interchangeable, which is along the Brock Road and the Fifth Corps front for the Federal Army and and uh, Anderson's First Confederate Corps on the Confederate side, um, and. You know, as a writer, I'm always looking for that great soundbite, which, you know, uh, I used to work in radio. So, you know, you're doing an interview and you're always looking for that good soundbite that's going to kind of bring the story to life for you. So when I'm reading accounts, um, I'm always looking for like, you know, what's that great quote that's really going to be colorful and add something and be insightful or describe something in a colorful way. So I always kind of writing with sound bites in mind as I'm looking through stuff. Uh, that's why I love like John Brown Gordon's memoir. Like I don't believe half of what he says, but boy, he can turn a phrase. It's wonderful. So um, as I was just kind of, you know, looking for sound bites, a tempest of iron and lead, um, it just jumped right out at me. It's like, oh yeah, that's a good one. That's a good one. Um, and, and I had, I can't remember, I had maybe five or six to, to choose from, but that one just kept rising to the top. Ted Savas really liked it. He said, as soon as he saw it, he was like, yes, that's it. That's the one, you know? So it spoke to us. Mm -hmm. And of course you've authored quite a few books, but where does this rank uh, um, up there with, uh, you know, some of your favorites? It's like asking like, who's your favorite child? I know, but come on, you've got to answer that. <laughs> I guess I like, I always want my newest book to be my best one just because I want to be getting better and improving. And, and so, you know, I get you. yeah, but like each, each book has its own thing about it. I like, and it's its own part of the process. So like, you know, like I said, the, the intensiveness of this project uh, and the fact that it was just so alive as I was doing it, you know, I loved that about it. Uh, you know, yeah. I'll always love this book because it. Uh, um so, somebody else, another author. I don't know whether it was you or maybe somebody else. They they refer to. I oh know it was Jim Hesley. Rever he referred to his books as his children. Yeah, yeah, you know, and, so, <laughs> and I suppose they are. You know, you care about them, don't you? You yeah. nurture them and you look after them and you know write them. You spend know. a lot of time. Um, a lot of time, with, lot them. time with them. Yeah, yeah. It yeah. was Jim. Yeah, um, he made that point about his uh, his sequels books and his Gettysburg ones. Uh, so, okay, because yeah. in in a sort of metaphorically like you're giving birth to this act of mm. creation you know i mean writing is an act of creation so you're you're you know creating this thing and uh yeah, yeah. And, and and so what's that feeling like when that box turns because you know you get that box delivered to your to your porch and you open it for the first time and you get that smell of the book and you get the feel of it and the what's that like for an author uh i still love it that's uh I'm, my wife would say that I do this for that. Like, I don't care. I'm not in it for the money. I'm in it. So when that first box of books shows up and I open it up and I'm like, Oh, and it's like this just. My uh, precious. Yeah. Yes, I know. <laughs> but like in all seriousness, I'm like, it's still a thrill for me to see my name in print. And, you know, I've been doing this for a long time. And uh, I tell my students, like, I hope you never get tired of, opening up your own box of books, you know, whatever that might be, whether, you know, because they're going into all sorts of different writing communications careers. But it's like, you know, I still get a thrill opening that box of books when it shows up on my porch. And I can't wait to call my mom and tell her, you know, and like, here, mom, I got a book I sent, you know, like, because it's just so exciting. It's so wonderful. It's, it's the, you know, the fulfillment of so much and you finally get to hold it in your hands. So. Awesome. Uh, it's a wonderful experience and, and, and a super, super huge privilege, super huge privilege. I, day doesn't ever go by that. I'm not grateful that I get to do what I get to do. Yep. Okay. Um, last question is, uh, what does the battle of Spotsylvania uh, courthouse mean to you? Mm. Yeah. I mean, um, it means a lot and it's, um, you know, because of the personal connections I have to the battlefield, um, you know, sort of transcends the story of the battle, which is interesting to me in lots of different ways and on a command level, on a soldier level. Um, you know, this battle is going to be endlessly fascinating to me to the day I die. But because of the connections I have with this battlefield um, and the experiences I've had from, you know, walking it with my daughter when she's five years old to, you know, like I'm married into 
you know, a hundred acres of the metal field on the Eastern front. And, you know, I get to like have my own earthworks and, uh, you know, explore a, a, a undertold part of, of that battle and, and, uh, bring attention to a part of the battlefield that the people haven't paid attention to. Like, that's a huge privilege, you know? So just all these different connections are, you know, I got married on the battlefield, um, you know, so all these different personal connections have really imbued this place with uh, uh, specialness that uh, nothing else will, will exceed. It's almost like it was your destiny, a bit like Luke Skywalker. Oh, destiny. And, and yeah. my wife gets that voice, you know, if I yeah. like, Oh, okay. Get, get too much into a book project, she'll come at me with the Darth Vader voice. I'm like, you need to help with dinner, you know? <laughs> no! <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> okay. Um, um, let, so me, um, let me put in a quick pitch for preservation because yeah, I, I did it. mention earlier how a lot of this, the battle, particularly the first week of the battle, um, the land associated with the first week of the battle was well-preserved by the Park Service. Um, for a long time, but stuff that sort of happened after the mule shoot attack um, went unpreserved, uninterpreted. Um, so it's really been through the thanks, uh, thanks to the efforts of groups like the Central Virginia Battlefield Trust and the American Battlefield Trust that have started kind of picking up pieces of property that are outside the boundaries of the national park so that they can tell that fuller story of Spotsylvania. So great success story that CVBT has with Myers Hill, which is a, a fight that takes place on the 14th of May. It's disconnected from the rest of the battlefield. So the Park Service kind of ignored it for decades and decades. Um, CVT, CVBT bought that. They're um, developing it into an interpretive plan, um, you know, access, public access to that. And so it's neat to be able to tell this fuller story. Um the the house, let me look this house right over here over my shoulder. There we go. I got it. <laughs> Um, that property was recently bought by the American Battlefield Trust to help restore some of this area around where Sedgwick was uh, was promoted. Um, so preservation has been a real big, big part of Spotsylvania's story going forward. And that's only going to be more important because there's so much development pressure around here in central Virginia. And uh, the Park Service just doesn't have the resources to buy up property like it used to once upon a time. So the work of CVBT and the American Battlefield Trust is going to be really important to fleshing out the rest of this battlefield and telling that fuller story of Spotsylvania. And uh, I'm, I'm privileged to work with both of those groups and their efforts down here. And I uh, can't thank them both enough for really kind of stretching this story. Uh, CVBT owns the Harris Farm property from May 19th, for instance. Um, so I'm really grateful to both of those organizations for what they're doing to help tell that fuller story of Spotsylvania. Amen. Amen to that. And you answered my next question anyway, because I was going to put it, uh, say, you know, if there's anything you wanted to add. So you you sort of done that for me. Um, but um, so getting hold of a copy, ladies and gentlemen, head over to Um, I believe there'll be, will there be a link on the uh, Mercy Wars website at any point, Chris? We'll have some stuff up on the website. Um, Savage Bay will have some stuff. They always do some promotions on social media and stuff like that. So uh, yeah, they'll, um, if you're following ECW, you'll be able to find the book, I promise. Mm -hmm. So is it available now to purchase? Um, by the time this podcast is uh, available, yes. Excellent. Okay. Well, all that is left to say is for Chris Mikowski, I'm Darren Rawlings. We'll see you online and on the battlefield. Cheers. Mm -hmm.